be your camera. All right, good evening and thank you all for joining us. I'm Lula Freistadt. I'm the Executive Director of Smart Elections and it's a pleasure to have you here with our How to Hand Count Ballot breakout session, which is um, an, a time for us to really think about what are the things that might be coming down the pike at us during this election and other elections. And we know that this may be a contentious election and it may be um, that uh, the two sides dispute uh, the results. And one of the things that could happen is we could wind up going to hand counts. And so we wanted to spend some time this evening just talking about hand counts, hand count paper ballots. So that's what that means is that you have the paper ballots, generally they are marked by hand or by a ballot marking device um, if it's a voter with a disability. And then there's an entire process that's been developed over the years in order to securely and accurately count those. And we have two experts with us tonight, Virginia Martin and Karen McKim, who are gonna talk to us about how to make sure if you're doing a hand count of paper ballots that it goes efficiently and quickly, that it's secure because you have good chain of custody, uh, that it's transparent, that everybody can watch, and um, affordable is another really good point. Uh, so I'm just gonna um, just see if everybody, super, everybody seems fine. Do we have, uh, is everybody comfortable? Everybody's fine, everybody's seeing and hearing? We, um, just make sure that nobody has any issues to before we get started. Okay, I think we're good. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna play you a little clip of one of my um, favorite security experts, Andrew Appel. And I, this is just one little, one little moment in uh, all of Andrew Appel's wonderful studied um, presentations that I have a problem with. Uh, and it's because of the way that he describes hand counted paper ballots. And hand counted paper ballots, they get kind of a bad rap. And this is a good example of that. Uh, so we'll just listen to this little clip. Um, hmm. Oh, it's not showing up. Let's see what this is. This is a website, and we're going to go full screen with that. And we're not going to go to Zoom. And we're going to share the screen. So tell me what you're seeing. Are you seeing a screen now that says even optical scanners can be hacked? Yes. yes. Okay, so this is a wonderful presentation that Andrew Appel, who's a professor at Princeton, did, but you're gonna hear him describe hand counts in a way that frustrates me. But the paper ballot that you put into them drops into a sealed ballot box, and election administrators should maintain a clear chain of custody uh, of those ballot boxes so that they can be recounted. And a recount is by people looking at those ballots. It's more difficult to hack people, especially since the people doing a recount are usually in teams of two or three that represent more than one party and candidate. But a hand recount of the entire election is laborious and slow. So what- Okay, did you just hear him say that? Did you just hear him say that a hand count of the entire election is laborious and slow, not a ringing endorsement? And so what we're going to do tonight is talk about how a hand count of an election can be um, quick and efficient uh, and even a little bit fun. So we're going to get started. I'm going to introduce uh, Virginia Martin. And uh, if you, um, so, uh, Virginia, I just, I'm going to pin you up there. Uh, so we can see more of you. And uh, I just want to ask you a few questions. Just uh, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background. Sure. Um, I was for 11 years a uh, Democratic Election Commissioner in Columbia County, New York. Uh, we're a relatively small county. We've got about, how many voters do we have now? I guess about 47,000 voters right now. And 10 years ago, we instituted uh, optical scanning um, of paper ballots. 
It was the first time New York State had ever done any optical scanning. We'd always had lever machines before. And my counterpart and I decided that we weren't comfortable with relying on the uh, results that the computer told us. So we wanted to know, we each wanted to know for ourselves what the results really were. So we decided that we were going to hand count the ballots. And that's what we did. Um, New York State has a law that says that you have to hand count a certain amount of ballots. 3% of, of the machines that are deployed in your county have to be hand counted 100%. And that wasn't enough for us. It didn't seem like, and it's not a, a you know, a, a, an audit that gives you high confidence. And it didn't give my counterpart and me high confidence. So we started, we started counting all the ballots. And that's what we did the first election. The next election, we decided we didn't really need to count all the ballots, but we still counted a whole lot. And then with every election after that, we refined our processes and decided just which ballots, which races we needed to count. And frankly, we decided that we would count any race that anybody wanted us to count. And that wasn't a problem at all. And we got, we refined the process so that it was, it was easy. It didn't take very long. It wasn't that hard and it didn't cost very much. And I want to give people an idea of when we say that like 3% of the ballots isn't really a good amount of ballots to count. I want to give people an idea of just how little that can be. Now, this is the amount that are, is legally required to be audited by hand in New York. But I know what you told me in Columbia County is how many, it's 3% of the machines, by the way. So if these, if there's other votes that are coming in um, that are not counted on the machines, uh, for example, well, they, they've changed the law now. So let's just, let's just stick with the 3% of the machines. So say, for example, in Columbia County, how many machines approximately did you have? Uh, we were deploying 33 machines. So 3% of the machines turned out to be how many machines? One. One. <laughs> and that missed a lot of races. Right. So the mandatory audit in New York in that particular, you know, with that particular configuration wound up requiring that just one votes, votes from one machine be audited. And that's probably similar to many other counties in New York, right? Uh, yeah, sure. Counties of my size that, that deploy that number of machines. And if you deploy more, then you have to do more machines than that. And I just want people to note that there's, um, people are putting information into the chat and we're really, really lucky to have some uh, wonderfully informed people on the call, including Jan Bendor, who herself has been an election commissioner uh, and is very knowledgeable about hand counts, has conducted hand count audits, uh, saying that um, the propaganda by the electronic machine manufacturers has been a kind of Kool-Aid. Um, yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, so th thanks for that, Jan, and thank you so much for being here. So, and I wanna just ask one question about sort of the way that you wound up doing the hand counts, Virginia, did you do them in the precinct that night or did you do them centrally? And can you explain a little bit what the difference would be? Right, we did them centrally. Uh, what we did was we decided that we needed to get all the ballots back to the Board of Elections. Uh, we knew that, especially the first election that we did this, it would have been a massive undertaking to uh, figure out how to get all the ballots counted at the precincts and who was going to count it and who was going to oversee it, who was going to, uh, you know, make up the rules and make sure that everything was done properly and who was, and, and it was just going to be a long day for all those many, all those many counters or inspectors or whoever it was that we hired to do this. And there was no way for my counterpart and I to oversee that at all those different poll sites. So right. Just, you would, so you would have had to have a separate team hand counting in every single precinct or train your workers who had already been there all day to then right. count, which also yeah. would be exhausting. Exhausting. Absolutely exhausting. Okay. Right. And so, we didn't want to do that. And we wanted, we wanted to have control over it. So what we did was we decided that we were going to be very, very cautious about getting all the ballots, all the election materials back to the Board of Elections that night bipartisanly, and this was a key part of our process, we um, uh, put together bipartisan, we call them ballot catcher teams, that would uh, meet at, each one would meet at a different poll site at nine o'clock, and as soon as the election inspectors were done with the election and they had everything tied up in a nice bow and, you know, all the security tags and seals were properly on, the, electors, the, the election inspectors would hand off all the election materials, including the ballots, to this bipartisan team called Ballot Catcher Team. 
and that team would get into one vehicle. They had to ride together, and that was interesting because it was a Democrat and a Republican, right? So, and they did. They learned to ride with each other and spend the evening together. And they would maybe go to another poll site and then pick up materials from there, and then maybe another, and then they would wind up at the Board of Elections with, with materials, including ballots, from all the poll sites they had visited. And at the Board of Elections, they'd be met by another set of ballot catchers, bipartisan, who would look at everything they had brought, check it all in, and then as soon as it was checked in, it was instantly whisked off to a double locked, very secure room where it stayed all night long until the next day. Okay, so what, so is, a, what is a day, double locked, what's a double locked room? What is that? It's, it's a room that has, that has two separate locks, substantial locks. One of them uh, I held the key to, and the other one my counterpart held the key to. So there was no way for me to get into that room by myself. You and there, the, was no, there was no way for him to get into the room by himself. We had to agree on it together. You were, that's, you were the Democratic commissioner and he was the Republican commissioner. That's right. And no one else could get in that room besides you two Certainly commissioners. Not. Certainly not. We were very confident about that. So if you're going to audit meaningfully, just very quickly, why is chain of custody such an important step? If somebody got a hold of some ballots and knew how they wanted to change a race, they could, you know, access some hand-marked ballots and, and, and add some votes, change some votes, you know, uh, put some writing on a ballot, invalidate a ballot. They could do that. Right. So that's, that's the primary reason. Or other ballots could be stolen. So the, you, know, you, you, could, you could wonder the next morning, you know, when you opened up the room, what happened to the stack of ballots? Why don't we have them all? Right. But we knew that that wasn't a problem because, because of the security that we have. The audit can never be any better than the chain of custody. If the chain of custody isn't strong, right. then the audit really becomes meaningless. It does. Uh, I'm sorry. Yes. I, I came in a, a few minutes late. And uh, Virginia, I, I, I'm really enjoying hearing what you have to say. But um, were these affidavit ballots? Were they absentee ballots? Were they, uh, you know, they, they would hand mark ballots. Were they in envelopes? Were they not in envelopes? I'm, I'm sorry. I, as I said, That's I okay. You. They were the ballots that were scanned in the optical scanners. Okay. So at the end, so all the, all the ballots, all election materials come back to the Board of Elections at night, including affidavit ballots, including any emergency ballots if there were any. Um, but some of the ballots that came back were those that had been scanned. And so they were not in, they were not in envelopes. They were in a secure ballot bag that had been uh, sealed, it had been locked. Uh, tag numbers you know, were recorded on a chain of custody form that I'll show you. And everything was done bipartisanly, so everybody was watching what everybody else was doing. And we could have great confidence that the ballots that we were looking at the next day, or the day when we started hand counting them, were exactly as they were when the voter put them into the optical scanner. So yeah, so there's a couple different ways that you can do hand counts. You could do hand counts, for example, without machines. You could just do hand counts. You could just do a hand count and not have any voting machines at all. What we're talking about in, during this breakout session is primarily how to do hand count audits, which means you have a voting machine like a scanner that runs the ballots through and gets an initial count and then Virginia or Karen would generally be doing an audit a hand count audit in order to verify that the machine count is accurate uh, and it's a it's a great system because you have redundancy there you have that comparison um, right. that that gives you added uh, re added assurance so I'm just gonna play a video that uh, gives you an idea of what this like and then this, in this video, people are using the exact same process that Virginia was using. And then Virginia will show you some of the forms and some of kind of the, the actual technical details, which I'm really excited to get into because we just really uh, rarely get to see that. So um, just give me one second. And this is a video from a documentary that I made about why more people don't vote and participate in politics. And I did a section in this on, um, on hand count ballots. 
In optical scan, you have a piece of paper where you fill in the oval, uh, similar to your SAT test. There's still concerns about optical scan systems. We've seen them hacked down in Leon County, Florida. And we've seen errors with optical scan systems. In the 2006 primary up in Pottawatomie County, Iowa, it flipped the results of like nine elections. The electronic machines made by ESNS had miscounted every race on the ballot. So the 10% sample doesn't give you much confidence? It doesn't give me much confidence. It may give someone that's really hot with statistics confidence. We want every single vote counted and counted accurately the first time. If what people really trust are the hand counts, why don't we just do the hand counts in the first place? Sounds fine by me. And uh, most of the countries around the world do exactly that. In New Hampshire, it is in 45% of our towns. I'm Dennis Makovarich. We're in the Wilton Town Hall building. It's a hand count town, paper ballots. There'd be four people sitting opposite each other. I'm one of them. I would look at the bell and I would read it. This person is watching me read it, verifying that that's what I said. Then the person over here has a tally sheet and puts a check mark. The other person sitting there is observing that that person put the check mark in the right place. So there's four people four making people sure per ballot. that each vote is counted correctly. Yes. Do you have a hard time getting those people? No. People want to do it. There are problems with hand-counted elections just as there are problems with electronically counted elections. What's ultimately important is that whichever process you do, it be open, it be observable, and people have faith in the results that you get. So you were able to see that clip? Okay, great. And Virginia, that's fairly similar to the process that you were using in Columbia County, New York. Very much, yeah. We had, we had teams of four, you know, one person reading a, a vote aloud and another person watching like a hawk, the reader, and then two more people, one of them recording a vote with a hash mark and another one watching like a hawk. And they were bipartisan. Right, and now I'm actually really excited about this because this is something that we just like never see. It's sort of like we're gonna lift up the curtain and go behind the scenes. You know, we always talk about hand count paper ballots, but what happens? How, like, what, what are the mechanisms that make it possible, the forms, the organization, the systems? And Virginia, like, put all that together over the course of 10 years. And we're gonna see Karen's system also, which is different and also really, really cool. So show, do you wanna share your screen or show us some of the forms, some of the protocols that you came up with that really made all this possible and efficient and affordable? I will do that, I hope. I'm going to try right now. So I, I, one of the things when we were chatting that was fascinating to me was you were talking about how these forms that Virginia's going to show us would be out on the table. And so people would be, they could do a number of things at the same time because the forms would, would help them. So go ahead and, and talk us through this, Virginia. Okay, this is just a, a you know an introductory list of, of the, the different forms that I'm going to show you. Uh, first is a flow chart. It's not a form, but it's something that I developed to, to demonstrate just how safe these ballots are in terms of bipartisanship, uh, you know, and oversight. Uh, so I'll, I'll, we'll look at that kind of quickly. Well, actually, we'll look at all of these kind of quickly. And then we've got pre-tallying forms. Before you get to the hand count, uh, you have election night, you have the chain of custody concerns that we've already talked about, and I'll, I'll talk about, uh, uh, show you some of the forms that we use for the ballot catchers and for the inspectors who deal with the ballot catchers. Um, then also pre-tallying, uh, we've got reconciliation of the election materials, and that happens the next day. We call that bag opening. There are a lot of, there are three different bags. Uh, so they have to be open and everything that's in them has to be taken out and, and sorted and reviewed. And then we've got tallying. We come to that probably two days after the election. So I've got instructions on how to tally ballots and a, a, an example of a tally sheet. And then after all the tallying is done, uh, we've got post-tallying reconciliation where we uh, compare what the hand counters came up with to what the machine uh, showed and we you know, decide was the machine right or uh, were the hand counters right. 
So this is that form that I talked about, the bipartisan route of a voted ballot. And, oh, I'm on the wrong day. Let's see if I can get to the right day. Sorry. And then I'll just, um, I'll, I'm answering a question in the chat while she's doing that. We had some confusion about who we is when Virginia's talking about this. So Virginia was the Democratic Election Commissioner in Columbia County, New York for 11 years. And 10 of those years, she oversaw full hand count audits. Uh, and so that's what she's describing now is the process that was in place in Columbia County, New York, which I sort of garbled, but managed to put most of that into the chat. <laughs> so it's Columbia, no. Columbia County, New York, but it's it's county. It's well, county. all right, okay. okay. So, so you know, how do we know that a voted ballot ha has been safe from the moment that it was voted by a voter and to the moment that we certify? So, on election day at the poll site, you've got inspectors who are closing up the ballot bag, doing all their closing procedures. The inspectors and these two traveling ballot catchers, bipartisan, are completing a chain of custody form. And then they together take that bag and the form and other materials into a single vehicle. So they ride together. So there's never a time when the ballots are only with a Republican or only with a Democrat. Okay. And we're they, seeing that a lot in other states. Like we saw a video in right. Florida of single individuals just taking huge bags of ballots and throwing them in their trunk and driving off. And it's very concerning. Very concerning. Um, so after the ballot catchers have collected everything that they were instructed to collect, they get to the Board of Elections and they deliver the bag and all their materials to a board sighted ballot catchers and they review all the tags and the seals, make sure the numbers, you know, make sure that everything is intact and make sure the numbers are right and they complete the chain of custody form, which I'll show you. And then two bipartisan runners deliver all the materials to this double locked room that we talk about. And that's where everything stays until the next day. So and are you, know, you there throughout all of this? You're there also oh, yeah. overseeing this and, you know, oh, yeah. welcoming the ballots, checking everything. You're there. Yeah. It, and if it's not, it, I'm there overseeing. Sometimes I'm checking in, but generally we have other people that we hire to do that. And so that brings up a good point. Who is doing all of this work? Some of the work is being done by our regular board staff, but most of it is being done by other people that we hire. We don't, if we had to rely on our regular staff to do all this, we'd never get it done. We have to hire other people, which is fine. Um, we pay them. They're typically inspectors that worked on election day. Some of them, not the, not the ballot catchers, uh, but our counters or our bag openers or inspectors that have worked with us before and we know them and we like them and they like us and they like working with us or other people that that uh, you know each of the of the two parties trusts so mostly these are extra people that we hire uh to do this work so that was election day election day plus one in the morning two boe staff bipartisan unlock the room where all the ballots are they bring the ballot bag and everything to the counting room and then the two bag openers or reconcilers check the chain of custody form, make sure everything is as it should be. They open the bag, they organize, they sort, they count the ballots into stacks of 50 ballots. So they count them so that they're ready to be counted by the next team, which is probably gonna start the next day. And what they do is they have a ballot accounting sheet, which I'll show you, and they confirm that the ballot numbers match. So they look to see how many ballots of the different uh, types were sent out to the poll site, um, printed ballots that were to go through a scanner, whether they did or whether they were used or not, affidavit ballots not to go through a scanner, uh, blank BMD ballots that, you know, if they got used, they went through a scanner. So they confirm that everything that went to the poll site they found in the bag. Of course, they're gonna be different because some of them are gonna be voted. They weren't voted when they went to the poll site in the morning. They make sure those numbers match. So I'm just gonna check in with you here. So what you're saying there is that there's blank ballots that go out to the polls. And then when these um, voted ballots come back, there's a reconciliation that makes sure that the number of blank ballots that are left, the number of ballots that are voted, and the number of ballots that got spoiled 
all equal the same number of ballots that went out so that there's no extra ballots somehow that got into the process or there's no ballots missing. It's a, exactly. recon it's a reconciliation process. It's exactly. And it can take a little doing, but we do it and we, and we, you know, we get it right. Uh, and this is, it's so important that we get it right at this point, because if you don't get it right at this point, then you're going to have a problem down the line. So we make sure that we get it right at this point. Um, and again, that isn't always the case. When I yeah. audited elections in Broward County, Florida, we found that the number of voters did not match the number of ballots, and it was very disconcerting. Right. So this is really right. important, this reconciliation. Very. So, um, you know, after everything has been reconciled, two board staff, myself and a Republican deputy commissioner typically would look at everything, confirm the numbers, and then the bag would get returned back to the double locked room where it was safe. So two days after election day, typically, you would start the count, tallying the ballots. Um, so once again, you're unlocking the room, bringing the ballot bag to the counting room. And this is where you have the four hand counters, like we saw in that video that you showed, the four hand counters, two reading and two recording. Um, so they would get a bag, they would confirm that the bag's contents are what they were supposed to have, and then they'd count the votes, and then after they uh, counted the votes, they would deliver the counted ballot bag to two of us for a review, and we would look, and we would make sure that everything they did checked out, and every once in a while there was a problem, and we'd say, wait, 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 you, you need to do this differently, or, or this doesn't add up, or something like that. So that was a good time to find any errors that there were. Okay, and then in time, after all that was done, uh, two board staff would actually compare the hand count totals from each election district or each precinct, whatever you want to call it, to the machine totals. And we did it on a spreadsheet. And if it matched, wonderful. Then the bag just goes back in the room and it's, you know, that election district is ready to be certified. And then sometimes they didn't match, and we can talk about that later. Um, there's a process for what to do if it didn't match. And, you know, we got pretty good at that. There were different processes that we followed if it didn't match. And then we'd get to certification. If it didn't match, generally you'd go back and look and see if there was a problem with the machine count, maybe a ballot that the machine didn't read, like it, it couldn't, it wasn't, it, it didn't, it wasn't right. sensitive enough somehow, like to find a check mark, but your people had seen that check mark. So sometimes it was the way the machine read the ballot that would cause a discrepancy. That's right. And, it, and we never found that the machine made a mistake. We found that the, there were votes that the machine just simply couldn't read because they were, you know, done badly. But four people, two Democrats and two Republicans, could all look at that vote and say, ah, that's a vote. We're counting that vote. And in general, you never, in all the years you did this, found any major discrepancies between the machine count and your hand count. Is that correct? We didn't. We, didn't. we found little ones here and there, uh, which maybe might make some people think, oh, it's not that important. Well, let me tell you, in the local races, there are so many close races. I mean, there are races that are tied. There are races that are won by one or two or three or five, and there are a lot of them. So it yeah. makes a difference. It I remember difference. one year you actually did a chart of that, of all the races, like in the past year, that had been won by one, two, three, four votes. And that, it was right. amazing to That's see right. those close votes. Okay. Um, so we, we've got a bunch of questions, and we also need to um, move on a little bit because I want to make sure that Karen gets in here and shows her system. So do you want to just show us a couple of the forms? I especially would like, we maybe don't need to see all the forms, but could we see the tally form? I think the tally form is really interesting. Okay. I'll just, you know what, I'll just whip through these so you can see what you're missing. So this is the, what we did for making sure that ballot catchers knew who they were. These were instructions that we gave to ballot catchers and, our, and inspectors, and everybody got them so everybody knew what they were supposed to do. This was the chain of custody form that they had to fill out. Um, this is the next day, the procedure for opening poll and ballot bags that were returned from the poll. So that was very detailed, and everybody got to look at it. And I read the instructions out to all the people that were there counting, and any public that came, you know, candidates or anybody got to listen and, and ask questions. Everybody got a copy. Um, this is the ballot accounting sheet. This is really important, but I won't go over it, but it compares the number of ballots that were issued to the, the poll site to the number of ballots that were found. 
And, and one thing is we're hoping to put together a manual. That's one of the things that Smart Elections is working on is having Virginia put together a manual of these different um, procedures to help with hand counts. And uh, maybe we'll be lucky and Karen will we'll work on that with her also. And we'll right. That'd be great. Uh, have a, um, a joint authorship. But uh, this, this is all just a real treasure chest of, of information. So yeah, oh. do you wanna show us the tally sheet? Getting there, yeah. So okay. this, is, this is the instructions for how to use the tally sheet, essentially. Um, and again, this was read out loud to everybody that was there. And here we have the tally sheet. Uh, let's see. Okay, so this is for one particular race. And I hope you can see this all. You can blow it up a little if you want, maybe. Well, I want to see the whole, the okay. whole page. What's important here is that... Up here, you have the number of ballots. And I think I said that uh, we always uh, pack our ballots up in, in, in packs of 50. So typically, uh, the inspectors would be starting with 50 ballots and they would write 50 up here. And then they would go through and uh, call off the votes or the non-votes on every single one of the ballots. And there were uh, two different candidates here. I will blow it up. Uh, running on five different lines. And then there was an opportunity for, a, for recording a blank, which is a no vote, or a void, which is if somebody overvoted or something or other, or messed up their ballot, or a write-in ballot. So I'm trying to move this. Oh, there we go. Uh, so what the recorder would do is, if there was a vote for 7E, the recorder would make a hash mark under 7E, and then you make five hash marks. And then if you get to, you know, a sixth vote on 70, you would come down here to the next cell. And at the end of the pack, all the hash marks would be added up down here. And then each inspector, each counter individually would add all these up. And if they were starting with 50 ballots, then this is better total 50. And if it didn't total 50, it meant there was a problem. And it wasn't unusual for it to total 49 or 51 or something like that. And so, you know, they'd have to go back and, and figure out where their problem was. It usually wasn't that hard to figure it out. But this is the point at which you've got to figure it out. So they did. So you catch those mistakes early on. We and then all the mistakes early on. What I love about this, the genius of it, is that instead of having that whole sheet that we saw in the video where you've got all those little dash, 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 and it becomes kind of overwhelming, each one of those little boxes is five votes. And then the next right. box is five votes, right? And right. then five votes. So that becomes so easy to count. You're just right. going five, 10, 15, 20, and, and the form. And that's why the fact that she's developed all of these forms and protocols that can, that's why they were able to get this process, with, which other people describe as, how did Andrew Appel describe it as um, a, a something in slow? Uh, it, 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 I don't know. <laughs> and, you know, people describe this as slow or torturous, but here you've got systems that um, have enabled them to do this quickly and easily. So I think it's- And I, it's, I need to break, break in and say that Almost all of these forms were initially developed by the state of New York when we first went to um, audits and hand counting. So we start, I think maybe all of these forms started with the state of New York, but over the years, as we use them, we developed them differently. And this is what turned out to be user friendly for us. So I have no idea what other counties in New York State do. They probably have something like this. It's certainly not exactly the same thing, but it's something like this. And maybe other states have forms like this too. I don't know, but these are the ones that work for us. Great. And then you did also tell me that certain people seem to have an affinity for this and you would rehire the people who just seem to be good at it. Yeah, we would. And not only did they have an affinity for it, but they liked doing it. Uh, they liked coming in and working and it was, it became kind of a social thing, but it was also a very, Patriot, kind of patriotic thing to do. They love coming in and making sure that the count was right. And many of them were inspectors and they liked being able to say to voters who on election day might, you know, be expressing some skepticism or something other, they, they, they would say, look, I go to the board of elections after this is over and we hand count your votes. You don't have to worry about this. We're gonna look at your ballot. We won't know whose ballot it is, but we're gonna look at all the ballots. 
and it would give voters a lot of confidence. It was great. So yeah, there were some people who were really good at it. There were some people that weren't very good and you know, they dropped off one way or the other. And we were always recycling new people in, you know, because that happened. And then there were, there were veterans who were very good at doing this and they would teach them. And it was, it was just a lovely experience. So great. So here's what I want to do because the time I'm going to switch out. You can um, stop sharing and we're going to switch over and look at Karen's system, which is also a really cool system. And then what, what you might do is go through the chat and people have asked some questions in the chat, Virginia. And if you want to try to answer those and we can make that chat available via email to everybody afterwards, everybody who attended. Um, okay, I will, and I then will try, I'll try to do that. I just have to warn you, sometimes my computer acts up when I go into chat, but I will try it. Okay, and then I need to try, I think I need to unpin you. Um, I'm gonna get Karen, I'm gonna pin you, I think, and see if that works. Okay, and um, I wanna introduce Karen McKim. Karen is, is uh, someone who also has tremendous expertise, not just with ballots, but in auditing in general. Uh, I'm fixing it. Okay, no problem. So Karen, tell us just briefly a little bit about your, your background as a government auditor. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, longer ago than I'm gonna admit to you, I got a master's degree in public administration with a um, focus in program evaluation and quality management. And then I spent 30 years working for the state of Wisconsin government in various capacities as a quality assurance manager or a management auditor. And my most fun job was working for the Legislative Audit Bureau, which is the state equivalent of the GAO. And uh, we would just go into all sorts of state agencies where there were complaints or worries that something wasn't working right, and you know, study how they should be working and what was going wrong and how to fix it. And it was just fascinating. Uh, so yeah, and then when I retired, um, I got snapped up into election integrity, which turns out to be <laughs> a lot of stuff I'd been doing my whole career. But I know one of the things that you've always expressed to me is just really kind of a shock that in this industry, we don't audit the way that every other major industry audits. There is no way any local government or state government official who handled dollars would be able to get away with the stuff that election officials get away with not doing as they handle votes. It's just, I mean, you know, things that every other manager takes for granted in terms of accountability and transparency and, and being able to prove that they're accurate, you know, just goes out the window when they're dealing with votes. And uh, I mean, even in Wisconsin, the county clerks handle both marriage licenses and election um, elections. And, you know, I'm sure you go in their office and they collect the marriage license fees and I'm sure they reconcile the cash register at the end of every day. And, you know, don't misplace a dollar or get a dollar or a penny off for their marriage license fee collections. But then, you know, a couple times a year it comes around to certifying election results and they just sign off on the computer output without checking it. It's, yeah, it's breathtaking to me and I'm surprised it's not breathtaking to everyone else. <laughs> And I know in one, in the 2016 recount, you actually found hundreds of votes that weren't counted even in the recount because you just went through and looked at the spreadsheets and you saw that these votes hadn't been, um, they just had been missed, right? It was amazing. The way recounts work in Wisconsin is first the municipal canvas is certified, this is true and correct, and they pass it to the county canvas and then the county board of canvas certifies and says this is true and correct. And then they send it to the state elections commission and that's when someone can ask for a recount. So at that time, the city and the county have already certified the results as far as they're concerned. But yeah, when the Jill Stein campaign contacted me before they even asked for a recount and said, are there certain counties we should be looking into? And so I just sat down at my kitchen counter in Wanakee, Wisconsin and you know, did some work with a spreadsheet and I picked out massive miscounts, 440 votes in the city of Hazelhurst in Oneida County, uh, 387 votes in Ward 7 in the city of Milwaukee. And I mean, they were just obvious. They were really gross undervotes. I mean, you know, there were, for every 100 ballots cast, there were 66 votes for president. And that just doesn't happen. 
And so, yeah, I could, I could pick out big miscounts, again, from my kitchen counter in Wana Key. And those, those counts yeah, had already, already certified. They'd already been certified. Yes. Right, right. So let's go ahead and talk about this system that you developed. And what's wonderful about this system is that it's so transparent. They're using a document projector and everyone in the room can see the ballot and they'll do them. I think you started in batches of 25, but eventually you told me you worked up to, I think, um, batches of 200, right? Or yeah, I, it made me nervous, but the counters were comfortable with it and they kept being accurate. So I went along with batches of 200. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so just talk us through this a little bit. And then we're also going to show a video. Of, there's another, this was a way that they did it with digital ballot images, but then later they developed another system to do it with actual paper ballots, which I think is brilliant. And I hope um, I don't know if you have a photograph of that, but we have the video of those paper ballots going by. So yeah, I, I, wanted, I have a still image. Okay, yeah. so this is where you started. This was to um, do a, a, this was to do an audit of digital ballot images, right? Well, we we started. We wanted to do. We wanted to demonstrate risk limiting auditing in Wisconsin in 2014 before most people had even heard of it, even. And, since commission and, had already recommended it. And you were working with the Wisconsin Election Integrity. Yes, for, Wisconsin for, okay. Election Integrity. That's the we in this case, it's citizens. Officials just, we could never get officials interested in it and still, still don't. Um, anyway, we wanted to do these public demonstrations in the hopes that we could convince election officials to pay attention to auditing. But getting the paper ballots was way too expensive, but we can't do a RLA demonstration, a risk limiting audit demonstration without doing a hand count of some sort. So we got the digital ballot images and um, developed this, and, and none of us had ever seen a hand count that was in any way transparent enough to satisfy us as observers. So we said, we're going to develop a new way to hand count that's very, very transparent. And so basically what this is, is we decided that if we just projected the ballots one at a time up on a screen, we could give everyone in the room one of these little handheld click counters um, and they could count the votes as they go by. Um, let me see. Um, yeah, the, the, we rapidly worked out that people only need to see the ballot for a half a second. So you could keep it going by pretty fast. Um, but let me see. Oh, come on. I'm trying to advance my slide. Okay. Um, yeah, you can have many, many people in the room. And what we did was we would designate two official counters and they would each count for one of the candidates. And every candidate on every candidate had to have two people counting their votes. And every single person only counts for one candidate. You can't count all the votes at once. Um, and then the ballots would go by and they'd click count. And at first we stopped at every 25 ballots. And then they, the two pairs would read it out. You know, for Paul Soglin, I got 13 votes. For Paul Soglin, I got 13 votes. And then we would record it. And this was the second time we did this. We would record the subtotals over on that flip chart over there. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, that there's no functional limit on the number of observers. As big a room and as big a screen as you can get, and as I think I have a box now of 80 click counters, and um, you just hand out the click counters and everyone can count, and they can hear what the counters are announcing as their totals and see them recorded, and then they can check it against their own. And, it, and I mean, this way you get the full transparency. You know the hand count is... Uh, being accurate. So just let me just so just to review that for people just to make sure that people understand. So what's happening is there is a ballot and it could actually be a real paper ballot. Uh, we'll show you a version like uh, where, where you have real paper ballots or it could be a digital ballot image. It's projected up on the wall with a project with a document projector and then two people in the room are clicking for each candidate, right? Two people for one candidate, two people clicking for the other candidate. You go through, you project. Two official counters for okay. each candidate and any number of other people can be observing and counting. Okay, and then one by one, the ballots get put up on the document, on the, on the, on the wall okay. using the document projector and people click when they see their candidate has a vote and then they stop at 25 
ballots and they compare and make sure that everybody got the same number. If you didn't get the same number, then do you go back and do that batch again? Yeah, yeah. You just, again, that's the advantage of small batches, but it, this is the count, the picture you see on your screen now is, is where we actually, actually did want to do a public, publicly prove that the canvas had mis, had certified the wrong results. And so this was the most official hand count we did. And again, this was the one where, you know, all the counters sitting around the table there got so proficient at all counting the ballots, the same, the votes the same way, that yeah, they were going up to 200 before they would stop and compare. And, oh, so and this, it right. this is the setup, right? This is the setup that goes with the- um, This is the setup that okay. goes with using paper ballots. Great, so I'm gonna show you guys this video now, just, uh, um, you're going to need to stop. Well, hang on a second. Okay. Can I explain what's going on here first? Yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. Uh, we we much preferred auditing with paper ballots to digital ballot images when we'd done both. And the nice thing about the paper ballots, you can see the stack right there. Those are actual paper ballots marked by the actual voters. And the clerk would bring them into the room. Every observer who wanted to could verify the chain of custody, the initials on the envelopes and stuff. They could see the ballot bag was sealed and you know had been firmly sealed. They could see it being opened. The deputy clerk would take the ballots down, you know, straighten them out underneath the document camera there in this second. And then she would just start moving them one by one off to the side as the, which would make, you know, the ballot image projected on the wall change and people would count and then at the end you know she would and the counters could say stop anytime they saw an ambiguously marked ballot or something like that um, and then she'd pack them up and reseal them in the bags and I found it very comforting that only one person in fact you know an election official could touch the ballot other forms of hand counting they're used in Wisconsin you know, the ballots are passed around, you know, stacked into stacks of 25 or 50 and then passed back and forth to get the redundancy that you need in every accurate count. But in this one, you could get just one person handling the ballots and get any number of redundant counts of those votes. Um, and very, very quickly, it went faster than any form of hand counting I've ever seen. So I'm gonna, I wanna show them uh, okay, yeah, now show them. I want to show them the video. Like. Um, and this is another advantage. That document camera you see sitting in the middle of the table there, that had a video camera attached to it. So we, we were recording it at the same time they were. And everybody looking at the screen, and set to zero, and let's go. Stop, stop, go. Stop, go. So for people who aren't used to this, the little line connecting is what creates the vote. If you're used to a little bubble filled in, the ballot looks a little bit different. And then you'll see sometimes there's undervotes. You'll see there's ballots where nobody's been voted for. And again, if you were one of the counters, you'd only be watching one of these candidates. And you'd be clicking whenever you saw a completed line for your candidate. So there's an undervote. Go. So um, I'm sorry, Karen, and I, I, I wasn't skillful on the controls there, and I cut off the last thing that you said. Do you want to just repeat the last thing you were saying about the setup of the ballots? I can't remember what the last thing <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, we've got a few minutes, and I want to um, let people ask questions uh, to either Karen or Virginia. Do you guys have some questions for them? I did want to touch on one other thing. Yeah, again, you, you don't see it in that the video from Racine or, or the image I saw from Racine, but in other times where we had the space in the room, again, we would have someone entering the subtotals 
you know, whenever it paused to compare the totals, someone entering that into an Excel spreadsheet that would be projected on a second screen. So, and the form looked very much like one of those forms Virginia had, except it, again, it was projected on the wall, it was, it was filled out. So that made the um, compiling of the subtotals also transparent. That's yeah. fantastic. So does anybody have a question for either Karen or Virginia? Go ahead and just unmute yourself and jump in. I have a question. It's Mike. Uh, Virginia, the, yep. you, you had mentioned that uh, you, the BMDs were different than the, the, the ballots that were marked by the BMD were different than the uh, ballots that were hand marked. Is, uh, what ballot marking device were they using? We were using uh, and still use the Dominion ICP. Okay. Uh, uh, right. I, I used, I image, used the, cast, yeah. image cast. Precinct. Image cast. Yeah. So, I used the auto mark down on Long Island. Uh, yeah. In Nassau County. And the auto yeah. mark ballot was actually ripped from the pad with the number. Right. Okay. So it, you know, the go, going to the poll side, what we would send would be pre-printed ballots and then affidavit ballots, which are different. And then a blank BMD Mm -hmm. booklet and it was the blank BMD paper that was fed into the ballot marking device which after the voter made all her choices then printed a ballot that looked exactly right. the same as the pre-printed ballot you could not except, tell the difference except and then the it number. came back out to the voter and then the voter scanned it into the optical scanner right. but it didn't have the number no it didn't have any number right. and when you know, when um, the bag openers were reconciling the number of ballots, they would see that there was, you know, maybe one blank BMD ballot missing, and they would note that there was one extra scan ballot. They wouldn't know which one it was, because you can't tell the difference. But what Mike is saying is that you can tell the difference because the BMD number. ballot didn't have a number, and the other ballots all had a number. No, what number? They don't have, what number? Yes, they do. What number? In Nassau County, they used to number the ballots. Yeah. After they so were voted, they, voted ballots are numbered? Yeah, yeah, just one, two, three, four, five, just consecutive numbers so that they could count them later. And uh, my ballot voting in the auto mark actually had a number written on it by the um, ballot, by the poll worker. So in that, after you, oh, that's, that's stunning to me because as far as I'm concerned, that identifies the ballot and the voter. No, we didn't have any kind of numbers. No numbers. No way to identify. One of the things that Mike is pointing out is Mike is, uh, I hope you don't mind my introducing you. Mike Godino is a disability advocate who's blind. He's been working with us at Smart Elections. And one of the things that's really important in this whole process, that as much as possible, ballots from a ballot marking device and ballots from and handmarked paper ballots need to look identical so that because often there's much fewer voters um, using a ballot marking device in this type of a setup uh, and we want to make sure that their votes are not you, you know that, that it's not possible to identify who right. those um, who they voted for just because they voted on a ballot marking device so that's and, and not all the systems are like that like one of the systems that they're um, looking at possibly with the Express Vote XL, which is coming possibly getting certified in New York, which makes a very different type of ballot. It's actually a ballot summary card that the computer prints out. And one of the possibilities is they're saying, well, they could use that just as a ballot marking device and continue to use the handmarked paper ballots for the rest of the voters. And that would make just an incredibly clear, yeah, a completely different ballot that the, oh. um, anyone who used the ballot marking device would be voting on and, and would be betraying their secrecy. So it's something we all have to be really conscious of is in the process of, of trying to have accurate elections, we need to make sure that voters with disabilities are always included, that their needs are addressed, and that we're really thinking about are they able to vote privately, independently, and securely. Those are things that are really big priorities for smart elections. We're really okay. glad that, that Mike has been working with us. Anybody yeah. else? Any other questions? Yeah. Um, and just to, to your point, Virginia, about uh, privacy with the other ballots that are all marked with a number, there is no way to attach that number to the voter. No. Um, okay, well, that's uh, good. I'm glad yeah. to hear them. <laughs> yeah. It was just a number, the, the number coming off the pad, one, yeah. two, three, and that number was not attached to the voter at all. Right. 
But I had another question. Okay. Good. When, you, when you talk, Virginia, about the reconciliation in Suffolk County, I've only worked the polls a couple of times, so I'm a newbie, but we do a reconciliation at the precinct level. Yes. Do you That's do right. that as well and then back at Central? Yes, both. Absolutely, yes. At the precinct level, the inspectors absolutely have to reconcile. Yeah. And their reconciliation becomes part of the, one of the tools that the bag openers the next day back at central office look at to try to figure out what they've got. Yes. So there's a reconciliation at the end of election night after polls are closed. And then there's one the next morning at central. Oh, okay. Good point. Okay. Next question. Anybody want Can to I ask a question? Up? I of had course. a question for, for Karen. Hi, Karen. Um, you had mentioned in our communication that the, um, you know, some of the ballot images in Wisconsin were, you know, uh, hard to come by or, you know, some of the files were duplicated or did that get in the way at all of the audit? Because I know, I think the first um, image that you showed was from digital ballot images. And I'm wondering if, you know, those were widely available for the audit. Um, yeah, the di we got the digital ballot images fairly easily from the Dane County Clerk back in 2014. We were the first people that ever asked for them. Um, but either he at that time, and I don't think he still, and I don't know any clerk who does, has a good chain of custody procedure and documentation for uh, verifying that the digital ballot images are a true and correct set of the actual paper. Uh, it, it's a problem that could be solved probably, but I don't know that it has been yet. And it wasn't back when we were doing those public digital ballot image audits that I showed you the picture of. Um, but we were, our purpose was only to demonstrate risk limiting auditing and show, you know, how easily a, a publicly verifiable hound count could be done. And um, if we had been trying to do, for instance, what we were doing in Racine, which is we were trying to publicly prove the county cannabis had certified the wrong vote totals, then making sure the digital ballot images had a good chain of custody and were a true and complete set of the ballots would have been a big problem. It wasn't in our, in our early odds because we were just sort of playing around demonstrating technique. But yeah, we never got a set of digital ballot images from the Dane County Clerk that was complete. Uh, you know, we'd always get, you know, two copies of the digital ballot images from Cross Plains Ward 4 and, you know, Wards 8 and 7 in Belleville missing. And the Dane County Clerk was never able to remedy that for us. Uh, I mean, I just mattered a lot if it was a real audit, but it didn't mm. matter for our purposes. Now, they may, I just want to clarify a few things for people. I, I think probably everyone on this call knows what digital ballot images are, but they're an image that a scanner makes when a paper ballot goes through. Marilyn Marks has instructed me not to call it a photograph. She said it is not a photograph, but it is an image that is created um, by the scanner. And then those images, if they are, if the machine is programmed correctly, are stored on the computer's memory or on a flash drive, and then they can be counted. Hopefully, they should match the paper ballots. Um, and then things like this, like chain of custody of the digital ballot images are very important. I, the Dane County clerk is now putting their digital ballot images all up online. So they may have solved the problem of incomplete sets, but I don't think that they've addressed the issue of chain of custody with the digital ballot images. It's an ongoing issue if we're going to rely on digital ballot images that they be secured. One of the things that another expert, Ray Lutz, has recommended is that the digital ballot images be, um, uh, be stored with what's called a hash, a security hash, which is something that they use, for example, like in blockchain. And that way, if anything in that group of images changes, the hash would change and would then um, be an identifiable mark that the digital ballot images had been changed. So there are um, security procedures. These are all kind of 
um, things that are in the planning stages, there are proposals that have been made. They are th those type of security systems w are not in place currently with digital ballot images. And I, I'm just going to do one more thing, Karen. If people want digital ballot images, generally you have to do what's called a public records request or sometimes also called a FOIA, Freedom of Information Act request, you will write to your county clerk or the supervisor of elections and request the digital ballot images for a particular election. You'll tell them the complete set, whatever it is that you want. There may be a cost, hopefully not too much, since it's just putting things on a disk probably. And that's how you would get digital ballot images is through a public records request. Back to you. And again, digital ballot images have advantages. This here is the entire, set of or almost entire set of ballot images from the april 2016 dane county the primary in april 2016 from dane county that's them i paid the dane county clerk i think probably 18 dollars for the for the uh cost of the yeah i don't know why he had to pay 18 dollars for that <laughs> that's it that's a hundred percent of the dane county ballots from that election Right. So just so you know, it's eight o'clock now, but I'm happy to stay on. And if Virginia and Karen want to stay on and answer more questions, we can do that. Do you have a few more minutes? I'm good. Okay, we're good. If people want to keep Point Man raised hand. Let me, Geraldine, let me just get someone named Point Man raised hand. Point Man, you have a question? You have the floor, Point Man. Okay, we'll come back to you. Suzanne O'Keefe, raised hand. Suzanne, go ahead. Hi, uh, yes, um, this is awesome. Thank you so much. I've been wondering about this for a long time. Uh, I was wondering, I have, I regularly watch this video from London and I was wondering if you might be able to explain how this, your system compares to what they're doing there. I, it looks, you know, that they're doing it real time. This is their actual count, not an audit. So I, you know, this is what happens the night of. Are you sharing your screen? I just put it in the chat. Oh, I see. Do you, um, here we can. Do you want me to share the screen? I can do that. I'll pull it up. Uh, so you're just wondering what the difference is between this system and uh, like Virginia or Karen's system? Right, I, I didn't know what they knew about how they did it in England. I was just, I'm just curious how they've organized it there. I've seen this video too. This looks mostly to be like they're opening the ballots here. I don't see counting happening here. Yeah, I, I have no idea. Virginia or Karen, do you want to comment on that? Um, the only thing I'll say is if that's from England, uh, yeah, I, yeah, it didn't look to me like a hand count either. It looked like an opening and a sorting. Right. Um, but the thing about hand counts in the United States versus elsewhere is that we just put so many more races on our ballots. Yep. If, if you could look closely, there was probably only one race on that ballot. And so they can hand count by sorting them into, you know, candidate A, candidate B, candidate C, and count them that way. Um, yeah, it's... We have to, we always have to keep that in mind when we're comparing hand counts here to hand counts anywhere else in the world. We just put way too much on our ballots. But I think one of the great things about your system, Karen, in particular, is that because you can have different people counting different races, you can count as many races as you want, as long as you have the people, you know, two clickers per race. So you can do multiple candidates on the same pass with that system. Yeah, and the hand count could be live streamed even. We recorded it on video, you played the video, but it could be live streamed. And, and Virginia, you told me about your system where they, you, you had the um, counters with different tally sheets, all like seven tally sheets all out on the table and they were counting multiple races at the same time also, right? Yeah, they sure were. And typically a tally sheet might include just one race or maybe it would be two races. And so they might have, yeah, seven or eight different tally sheets. So um, the person that's doing the tallying has to go from sheet to sheet to sheet to sheet to sheet as an entire ballot is read off. A little complicated, but you know, they, they did it, they liked it. 
it worked. And they got good at it because they, they were, like you it. said, they were trained at it. Yeah. So in that instance, you have one ballot and then you've got multiple tally sheets and someone's calling out the race for each, who the candidate who won for each race. And then the person is going on different tally sheets and making the mark. That's right. So, and, and it needs to be said that we didn't always count every single race. Um, if we weren't in the midst of our state mandated 3% audit, we would count certain races. We had uh, determined ahead of time that there were certain local races that we would count and others, like, you know, they weren't, uh, there wasn't another candidate running against and we didn't count those races. So the, the readers would skip certain races and only count some. Right, uncontested races you did not count by hand. Yeah, yeah, I don't like to use the word uncontested because a lot of people think that if somebody rent, wins in a landslide, it's not contested. I don't use the word that way. But if there was no other candidate on the ballot, there, there, you, you didn't feel the need to hand count that race. Right. Okay, let's take some more questions. Geraldine, I know you had one. Well, mine was going back to, I was not familiar with the term RLA. So I guess this is very basic about what is a risk limiting, risk limiting auditing. I think, Karen, you were talking about that. Yeah, the quickest way to describe an RLA is everyone knows what an exit poll is, right? You sample a bunch of voters as they leave the polling place. You make sure your sample's big enough. You come up with a statistical, well, I think there's, you know, within this many percentage points, this person was the winner. Okay, same general idea, except after the election, you sample ballots, not voters and hand count them to see who they actually did vote for. Ballots aren't going to lie to you. And as long as your sample's big enough and your sample is selected correctly, really, truly randomly, you can calculate, get to the point where you say, well, there's a 95% chance if the voting machines did identify the wrong winner on election night, there's you know, a 95% chance we would have noticed that. Uh -huh. And so your risk limit for that would be 5%. There's a 5% limit on the risk that you'll fail to notice the wrong winner. And mm -hmm. so, I mean, the, it works out. It gives you much more confidence in the elections even than that 5%. But that's what a risk limiting audit is, basically. I see. Thank you. So, and some people will say, well, why do a full hand count or why do a risk limiting audit? And I actually wrote a paper on this, which I will put into the chat. And the, this is, it's a long, it's like a 39 page paper. So <laughs> I'm going to do it in great detail. But the general, uh, my perspective um, was do full hand counts where you can easily and quickly do full hand counts. So for example, in counties that are, 50,000 active voters or less, Virginia demonstrated in Columbia County that it's just not that hard to do a full hand count. And uh, I think, what was your average cost of your annual budget, Virginia? We found that it was about, uh, and, and the audit that we did cost about 1% of our annual budget. So very, one, one and a half percent. very affordable. So in counties yeah. that are small enough to do this comfortably, quickly, and affordably, I would recommend doing full hand count audits, um, or you know, as Virginia said, we call them modified full hand count audits because you're not doing a, a hand count. For example, if there's if there's no contest on the ballot, if a candidate is running uncontested, there's, for, there's other options too. With with the risk limiting audits that we were doing in Dane County there for a while, uh, Dane County is a heavily Democratic county, and the Democrat always wins the county by a large proportion. And with risk limiting audit, the size of the sample that's prescribed is based on the margin of victory. So every now and then we'd have we'd have an audit where the uh, statistical formula for the risk limiting audit said, you know, audit 32 ballots, <laughs> you know, and that yeah. was just ridiculous. I mean, we actually had this discussion as we talked about there's such a thing as statistical confidence, and there's such a thing as emotional confidence. Right. And whenever we had a sample size come back 32 ballots you know, no we wouldn't we just keep counting until everyone in the room said okay okay i'm convinced i'm convinced exactly you yeah. don't have to stop an rla with the prescribed statistical sample size you can keep going until you're until everyone who needs to be satisfied is satisfied 
Well, I have to say, you can, if you're doing a citizen audit and you're in control. However, if it's an official risk limiting audit that the state is doing, they are not in general gonna count a single ballot more than the risk limit instructs them to. So if the risk limit instructs them to count 39 ballots, that is probably all they are going to count. And as you said, there isn't necessarily a lot of emotional confidence in that. So I just wanna, in art, in the paper that I wrote, which I put into the chat, my recommendation was to do full hand count audits in counties that seem very manageable, like 50,000 active voters or less, and in larger counties where, you know, if you're gonna get into New York, there's 4.5 million active voters there, then probably a risk limiting audit is gonna be much more realistic. Um, and then I just wanna show you also the, the, the breakdown of the counties. This is a screen, um, this is a chart that Ray Lutz put together and it's a breakdown of all of the counties in the country uh, by size. And it's a really fascinating chart. You can see, like this is uh, Alabama, and you can see that like from six until about 20 there. So that's about, um, 14 counties that are 50,000 voters or more. Do you see this category F is the number of active voters? But then you can see after that in Alabama, you can see that there are many, many more small counties. So from 21 going all the way down to 72, so over 50 counties that are less than 50,000 voters there. So just imagine. If, if many, many of the small counties around the country were doing full hand count audits, we would have a baseline to compare to the larger counties. So that would be one thing. And we would also have great confidence in those counts themselves. So the idea that we could start doing full hand count audits in many small counties, I think is a really doable idea and could just provide tremendous increase in confidence in the results and give us a lot more data about what results we might be looking to expect in the larger counties. Um, more questions? I've got a hand up from Mark Smith. Uh, you need to unmute. You'll have to unmute yourself. I, um, okay, yeah. Uh, I, I had a question for Virginia because I thoroughly enjoyed the uh, how you put um, the information for it about the multiple days of certification. Uh, but does uh, I presume the uh, the um, uh, what's the word the uh, where you get the the ballots from the polling uh, where the the ballots where you uh, where they would be picked up from were they still like precincts? Uh, if they were they still like reporting to the news and so forth, uh, were they doing their own counts of like what the ballots were in their precincts? Hmm. The, the the optical scanner uh, does a tabulation at the end of the day, and it mm -hmm. also uh, prints off a, a results tape. So the results okay. tape is then uh, made public. It's posted on the wall, and it also come a copy of it comes back. Uh, with the ballot catchers in the security bag and also what comes back is one of the two um, uh, mem I can't remember what they're called memory cards from the machine that has all the voting data on it uh, and okay. one is left in the machine you know it's a redundant one the one that comes okay. back to the Board of Elections then is inserted into our election management system and that mm -hmm. is uh, uploaded to our website it's also uploaded to the state so okay. the short answer to that question is yes <laughs> the the reports but, but, are, but, but the but results there's lots of redundancy lots yeah. of redundancy yeah. Yeah. and the results are being reported right. just along with any other county in new york those preliminary night results are being reported on time and you never missed your certification deadline by doing the hand count audit did you virginia no we didn't certainly not Okay. okay. Um, but I will questions. say New York State has a has a lovely long period of certification, twenty five days, and not every state has that. Good. Other questions? Thank you. You're welcome. 
I want to ask Jan Bendor since she's here. Uh, Jan, do you want to have, do you have any comments? I know you've done a fair number of hand counts yourself and also we're even looking into designing uh, forms or, or ballots that would be easier to hand count. Uh, do you want to share any information with us? Well, th thank you, Lulu. I wanted to make people aware that our current ballots are designed for machines to read them. Uh, they're generally all one font, same font size, uh, the same uh, unreadable amount of white space or lack of it. And, and anyone who's had graphic arts training knows that uh, our perception is very much governed by white space versus the dark print. Um, and so uh, at the 2011 election verification conference in Chicago, uh, we had the first ever really interesting presentation by some graphic artists who had designed some new ballot formats and showed uh, in a limited study that they vastly reduced the errors made by voters. Voters overlook uh, certain places to mark. They skip races unintentionally. I think uh, uh, some of these undervoted races that were so suspicious in 2016 may have been in part uh, the result of uh, the way the ballot was formatted. People just didn't see it. You can look right at it. That's so, fascinating. So even, so not only is the ballot hard for the machine to count, or, or it's not, not only hard for people to count because the ballot is designed for machines to count, the ballot is also hard for people to read and mark because the whole focus of the design is the machine. It's all about the machine. All about the machine and, and the exactitude of those coordinates on the page, which is how uh, the digital scanner finds the mark. Uh, that particular place must be blocked by the scanner beam. Right. So uh, that, that suggested to us at Mira that we should design a human factors uh, research study. And we did. And uh, we're still trying to get the funding for the study, which isn't really that much money. Uh, to take human subjects uh, with the appropriate number of controls and see uh, how that affects voter mistakes and human hand counting mistakes, which would, I assert, be much improved and sped up. Uh, when I saw Karen's group looking at that projected ballot, I could see that it, with different light conditions in that room and the glare off of the screen, <laughs> uh, there, there's a tendency to create errors there uh, by the counters. Uh, and the machines have the same problem in some cases with the lightness and darkness of the mark, but I think humans are more likely, we, we see in gestalts, we don't actually see literally uh, X's and O's. And our brains tend to look at a group of things rather than a single thing. And if artists that's, are- Yeah, that's, I think that's really fascinating. And I hope that you do get the funding for that study. And I'd even be interested in, in the presentation that you saw that kind of got you thinking about this. Would love to see that. Um, but I wanted to ask you one other thing also. I know that you had done a calculation of the amount of money that Michigan spent on their new voting machines and how many years uh, they could have paid people to hand count the votes with that same amount of money. Mm -hmm. Do you remember those figures? Uh, yes, and thank you for reminding me about that. Uh, we published a report in, in 2014 predicting that in 2016 we would have an election cliff and a whole lot of bad things that would happen because our machines were almost 15 years old and you know what a 15 year old car does. So um, at the end of that, we said, you know, instead of getting, uh, spending $65 million to buy all new tabulators uh, and, warrant and, and the uh, maintenance contracts, 
and only having those tabulators warranted for eight years. So think about it. We're paying $8 million a year for these machines. Um, that's excessive, really. Um, and the, just think of the capital costs and the opportunity costs that's lost when we are putting that much money into machines that are uh, not necessarily even made in this country. So we did a calculation of what it would take to, uh, to bring people in in the same way that Virginia has done uh, and bring them in uh, after the close of the election. So they're all fresh and they've been trained and they've been uh, able to work together well. They've already got their procedure ready, off they go. Uh, and if we did that, uh, we would be able to hire 20,000 Michigan citizens per year. Let's say we go to the max, we, we're only allowed to have four elections per year. And we would pay these people pretty decently too. Uh, we'd probably be able to have our elections hand counted for $65 billion for over 40 years. <laughs> and we would keep the money in our economy. We'd be paying people, right? So 40 years versus eight years with the same amount of money. And right. you'd have fully transparent, hand counted, accurate elections. Fully transparent. And uh, we would keep the money in our state. Right now, when we buy these machines, it's all going to private equity firms on Wall Street. We, it's dark money. We don't know who these owners are. We don't know where these profits are going. Uh, Elizabeth Warren has a bill in the Senate where she's trying to uh, daylight the dark money of the equity markets. Uh, unlike the, the stock exchange where it has to be a, a public, uh, ownership is secret with all of these machines. Right, these are the, um, all of the vendors in the country right now are all privately owned vendors. So I right. wanna wrap up, but Jan, thank you so much for those points and thank you for being here and just adding your expertise to this evening. It's really a pleasure to have you here. It's a pleasure to have everybody here. Uh, I'm so um, pleased with our attendance and uh, some of you I know uh, has spent a lot of time on this issue and some of you are, are new, um, but it's, it's wonderful to have you all. Uh, please remember to save the chat. A lot of good information went into the chat. And so if you, um, if you click on the little three dots in the lower right corner and click save chat, you can save it and then it'll ask you show in Finder and then that'll show you where it is in your computer. So you can have all of that information. And I can also email a copy of the chat to anybody uh, who uh, signed up on the Zoom, so I should have all of your email addresses. Um, are there any last questions before we wrap up? I'd like to say thank you, everybody. Round of applause to Karen and to Virginia uh, for sharing um, so much of their expertise with us. It's really, really a pleasure. Uh, last me, questions. I have, a, I have a quick comment. Yeah. Harvey Branscombe. Great. First of all, you only get to see the chat for the portion of the video that you've actually been watching. So if mm. there's a way for you to actually capture the entire chat and put it somewhere, that would be very helpful. I will, yes. I and I'll, I'll like I said, part of this call. I'll email the, it. Uh, I'd like to just propose very quickly, since there are very excellent hand counters on this call, th uh, three ideas that, are, that might be important. Number one, in the design of ballot styles, to have the contest always in the same place on the ballot style is super important for a lot of these hand counting methods, probably all of them. Because once the, the position of the contest is moving around on the ballot image or, and on the paper ballot, it's harder to be sure you've got the right contest. And yesterday I was watching Orange County ballot duplication using their amazing transparent uh, portal. And I could see where they were attempting to duplicate from one style to the next and, the, and they were not lining up. And it's, it's terribly confusing, especially when the format looks exactly the same in the two styles, but the contests are in different places. Really tough. Another idea, which I've used in hand counting in Eagle County, Colorado, is to sort the all democratic or all the uniform ballots first so that if they're all lined up for the same candidates, you can actually put those in a stack. And if, you, if you're using a hand counting system that requires several trips through the ballots in order to do different contests, you can set aside a whole set of them that are all voted the same, that are visually all the same, and you can set those aside and then just count the subsets that are different. And that actually speeds up a lot with the 
a recount or uh, audit method. Uh, Harvey, and, let me, are you talking basically yeah. about a, a sort and stack? Because we actually didn't bring that up at but all. It's but a that's modified, a modified sort right. and stack. Right. I just, I, we didn't talk yeah. about this, but if you're only counting one race, for example, if in this election we wind up having to hand count Trump and Biden, that one vast method of hand counting is you just divide the ballots into two stacks, one candidate and the other candidate, and then you count those stacks. That's called the sort and stack method. We didn't get into it here, but it's a classic method of hand counting. So, so I'm advising an extension of the sort and stack method that's a hybrid of the two, where you actually sort out certain sets of, multi, of ballots that are all voted the same. And if your election happens to have, you know, the Democrats all voting for the Democrats, and, and you have a whole bunch of ballots that are the same, you can actually sort those first, then you only have to individually count the remainder. Mm -hmm. And it'll vastly speed up certain kinds of uh, hand counts. Probably not the, the clickers on the, on, on the room because that's parallel, takes care of all contests at once. But almost all the other methods, uh, it works really well. And, and even for ballot duplication, it would work well. And I, and I have done it successfully. The uh, Orange County, uh, portal. If you sign up for that, you can see signature verification and ballot duplication. It's absolutely amazing uh, improvement on transparency for election watching that I've, I have, I've been dreaming about and I've been asking for, but it's actually happening in Orange County. Neil Kelly, the registrar, and it started a couple of days ago and, and uh, it's amazing. Harvey, do you want and, to put that uh, link in the chat for us? If there's a portal link for uh, people who want to watch that, if you have it. If not, yeah, you just email it to me and I'll send it out when I email the chat. I can do that. You have okay. to sign up for it. You have to sign up and get their permission because it's, it actually has PII in it. And uh, it's, it's, uh, I'm actually worried that, uh, that they haven't cleaned up the PII original, but the transparency is fantastic. And so the demonstration of the potential for crowd, crowdsourced watching of very sophisticated election judgments is, uh, is superb. It's, it's amazing. Is that in California, finally, Harvey? It's Orange County, California. That's right. Okay. The, uh, it's ocvote, ocvote.com or .org. I'm, I'm not sure, maybe ocvote.org. Uh, privacy is an issue with getting a hold of both ballot pa uh, paper and images. And in, uh, in mail ballot elections, that tends to be a problem because there are multiple styles in a batch and batches might have identifiable voters with them and individual styles might be an individual voter in the, in the voter list. So there are real problems with privacy that can also be solved by asking for redaction. And you could conceivably redact certain contests that are rare, that create rare styles. And I've actually done that in Colorado. Colorado actually has law that allows you to, specifically allows you to request only portions of a ballot image or a ballot paper in order to ensure there are enough instances of it, more than 10 in Colorado, to, to make it not a privacy invading uh, problem really important concept, but it is very difficult to do if, again, the contests are in different places on the ballot. So redacting could be relatively easy if all the contests are in the right place. That has to do with ballot order. Sometimes it's legislated what order the contests show up on the ballot, and it's, that's a kind of solution that can be put in place. Really okay. important. Pri privacy is an issue. That's it. That's all all right. right. Thank you so much for those details. I'm especially curious now to see the Orange County count. So we'll try to get that information, that portal to people. And then I had, I saw one more raised hand. Sharon Wheeler raised her hand. Sharon, you have a question, a final question before we wrap? Sharon Wheeler, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Maybe she gave up. Yeah. Point Man, right. Sharon, are you with us? And then Point Man raises. Like she so she like just chat, put in the chat that it was an accident. Maybe the hand oh, it was an accident. Yeah. Okay, no problem. <laughs> and then Point Man, did you have a Point Man? Do you have a, a final question? Okay, we're gonna wrap. And um, I'm so it, I'm I'm just so grateful for for all of this enthusiasm and interest. Uh, I personally have been a believer in hand counts for a long time. The clip that I showed you from my documentary came out in 2008. And it was something when I, oh, I went around the country and watched different ways that people were counting ballots. And I was really impressed with the hand counting and how much confidence it gave people. And I think we can see more and more how the technology is something that can be misused sometimes and causes a lot of doubt and anxiety and, and uh, causes us not to have confidence in our elections. Um, and so... Uh, Point um, Man's got one question. Do you have anything on signature auditing? 
we have not done anything on signature auditing besides the incredibly fast sort of drive by that we did at the end of our uh, last forum. So if you look at our forum that took place on October 6th, it's on our YouTube channel. The last 10 minutes or so is actually Harvey and um, Emily Levy talking a little bit about signature auditing. And I know Emily Levy at uh, um, um, Scrutineers is actually uh, had two full long sections about comparing uh, signatures and verifying signatures. Um, and then, you know, also Harvey is a font of information about signature verification. Harvey, do you want to just put your um, email in the chat and people can reach out to you individually? He has a website with lots and lots of information about mail-in ballots. He's followed that issue for years. I think he's one of the people who's most knowledgeable in the country about that. So Harvey, if you're up for that, put your email in the chat. and. Um, I'm going to say thank you again to everybody, and um, we're going to call it a night. His email is uh, electionquality.com. I'm almost positive. Yep, there it is. Yeah, Harvey at electionquality.com. Okay, so save your chat. And um, I think I spelled election quality wrong there, so <laughs> don't go by my don't go by my spelling. Okay, um, thanks so much to everybody, and have a great night.